you've had the relatively easy bit. Um, it does get a little bit more tricky from this point on. However, the point is that I'm, I wanted to emphasize that my aim is to try and help you understand, not to sort of baffle you with the, the obscurities of what's going, what's going on. But, but, but there will be moves, particularly in the move from the coming to that side, where it's a little bit uh, more difficult than we looked at. Uh, do you think, I think now, um, all I need really are the people who are registered for the module. So everybody else, you don't need to worry. But if you are registered for the module, if you could please just sign in on this. Um, that would be much appreciated. So I'm just going to circulate that if I can just have it back by the end of uh, uh, two hours. All right. All right. So I'm going to give a little summary of. I think the thing to do is give a bit of a summary of, uh, of where we've come to. Say a little bit about becoming looking, and then look at the shelling. Um, then have a discussion about what we've done so far, and then after that we'll look at the transition from becoming into determinate being. And with Bill up, we'll just go through determinate being, um, which actually then gets a bit easier, you'd be glad to know. Determinate being itself is, uh, it seems to me a little bit easier. So, we should be at uh, page 105, if you're in the Miller, uh, that's page 80, as far as I can see, at the moment of becoming. Um, okay, so a review. Um, so I'm not going to review why it <coughs> starts with pure being. I'm hoping that that is now uh, clear. Um, what I'm more interested in now is what happens once the logic begins. Uh, and Hegel's claim is that pure being vanishes into nothing because it is utterly indeterminate. It's so indeterminate in its purity that it's nothing at all. Note, though, this does not mean, I have gone over this before, but just to emphasize the point, that Hegel does not define being as indeterminacy, as in-determinacy, or im-mediacy. It is rather that being is utterly lacking in determinacy as pure being. And it's by virtue of its utter indeterminacy, the very purity that we're supposed to hold being to, if we're going to be presuppositionless, so the presuppositionlessness, the demand for radical self-criticism requires being to be thought as utterly indeterminate and pure, and by virtue of that utter indeterminacy, being vanishes into nothing. Um, now, there is a nice, uh, well, I find it a helpful statement that Hegel makes on <coughs> page 99, which is the bottom of 74, if you're in the Dijon. Uh, page 99, the bottom of 74. Uh, I'm just going to read the last bit of the relevant paragraph. Uh, page 99, it's, a, <coughs> it's, it's, a, it's the top of the first par par partial paragraph. Or it can be expressed thus, because being is devoid of all determination whatsoever. It is not the affirmative determinateness which it is, it is not being but nothing. Being is so indeterminate in being pure being, that it's that nothing, and vanishes before our eyes, which you know, is my phrase echoing what uh, Fichte had said about the derivation of categories, that Fichte's derivation of categories was meant to show the categories that emerge before our very eyes. Well, here's an example. Pure nothing, on the other hand, is sheer, utter nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Pure nothing. But because of its immediacy as that, of its purity and immediacy as that, it is just pure indeterminate being. And I take it this is what Hegel has in mind, although it seems to me it's expressed in a way that just invites mis misunderstanding. When he says that nothing is brackets, exists in our intuiting or thinking. First of all, exist is not a very helpful word, given that existence comes up in the logic of essence as a separate category, which is much more complex than anything we've got here. And secondly, the point is not that nothing exists in our intuiting or thinking. It's that nothing, by virtue of its purity, 
is that. And so nothing vanishes into your being. Each, therefore, is the vanishing of itself into the other. And so pure being proves to be its own vanishing into nothing. Pure nothing proves to be its own vanishing into being. And both, therefore, prove to be that vanishing which Hegel names becoming. And I suggested last time that even though Hegel says that being is not, it's not, it doesn't pass over, it has already passed over. That, in a way, is just to indicate the immediacy of what he's talking about. And anyway, he goes back on that just four or five lines below when he says that truth is therefore this movement of the immediate vanishing. Not of their having passed over, but of their vanishing. Now, okay, I should explain just methodologically what I'm trying to do here. Obviously, I'm trying to be as textual as possible. I believe in that. However, it seems to me there are moments where one has to also try and understand what's happening and what's occurring. Uh, and there are moments in, in the text where, you know, as in exists in our thinking and beauty, where it seems to me Hegel hasn't, hasn't helped himself. You might find that objectionable, and then you've got to deal with that in some way. And if you want to go with Hegel's own wording, well, then you've got to think through the implications of that. If nothing proves to be only in our intuiting and thinking, what if we didn't think it? Then what would happen? Then would just pure being be pure nothing be pure nothing? So Parmenides would be right. That can't be what Hegel's got in mind. Otherwise, the logic would stop there. Or the logic is just a phenomenology of our thinking. Yeah, I guess it could be. But then that doesn't square with everything Hegel says about the difference between logic and phenomenology. So, so um, as I say, I'm not, I'm not trying just arbitrarily to read out the bits that I don't like. I'm trying to make sense of what's going on in the logic. The logic, after all, is not just a book. It is a science. It's a way of thinking. Um, but anyway, I thought I should alert you to that. And there will be other parts where you might hear me say that, um, uh, you know, that I think this could be done better. All, all I can say that's not really a defense is that I'm pretty minimal in doing this. You should read, uh, you know, a lot of other commentators who are constantly revising and rewriting and saying, he should really have done this, he should really have done that. Um, I try and avoid that where possible. Okay, uh, again, note that uh, being and nothing are not fictions for Hegel. Hegel's argument is not that there is no such thing as being. But the being, when properly understood, is becoming. So the kind of opposition that Nietzsche will draw between being and becoming just is a false one for Hegel. Being is becoming. Heraclitus is right because Parmenides was kind of right, uh, not despite the fact. Okay, that's just to review um, what, what we looked at uh, last time. So I'm now going to go to page 105, that's uh, uh, Di Giovanni 80, and look at the moments of becoming. And, and this bit, I think, um, I'm hoping will be fairly straightforward. Um, so I'll say a bit about what's going on and then, and then read the actual section. Uh, obviously, since becoming comprises these two movements, Becoming uh, is being vanishing into nothing and nothing vanishing into being. Then becoming has two aspects to it. Being vanishing into nothing is the process of passing away. Uh, Hegel calls that fergeen, um, ceasing to be. Nothing passing into being is the process of arising, entstehen coming to be. But of course they form a circle, because being passes into nothing, passes into being, passes into nothing. So coming to be is ceasing to be, is coming to be, is ceasing to be, is coming to be, is ceasing to be. They are in fact aspects of one process. Now here we are a little bit in Nietzschean territory, actually. There's no creation without destruction, uh, is, would be another way of looking at it. Such becoming, remember, is logical becoming. This is not becoming in the horizon of time. Uh, time, although it characterizes our thinking of what's going on, doesn't belong thematically to what it is that we're thinking. Um, and indeed, Hegel will argue that becoming itself is needed in order to understand time. It's not the other way around, as we see when we get to uh, the philosophy of nature. Um, Right, now there's one complication that come, we have to think about here that, that will recur when we get to uh, uh, Hegel's account of infinity. 
And that is actually that being and nothing prove, in fact, to be two different things. Not, thing is not really the right word, but, but, but they, um, they transform themselves in a sort of twofold way. Each proves to be the very movement of its own vanishing. Each proves, if you like, to be the process of becoming. But each proves to be a moment of that movement, a moment of that process. Because becoming is the vanishing of being into nothing that being proves to be. Being proves to be the process in which it is one of the moments of that process. Because ceasing to be is just the vanishing of being into nothing. So that's a very typical sort of Hegelian move. Well, in the sense that you see it later. So when we get to the infinite, for example, the infinite will be the process in which both the infinite and the finite are moments. So something's being a moment of itself is already found here. And indeed, self-consciousness will involve that as well, in that self-consciousness will involve you know, my self-consciousness, our self-consciousness, will involve a relation to something else. So I am the process of relating to something else in which I am a moment of that process. Anyway, I just thought, you don't need to worry about it, but I just thought um, you, uh, you should note that here, and it follows directly from what Hegel is uh, saying. All right, uh, okay, let me just look at the paragraph then, and I'm hoping now that uh, it, 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 this should be fairly straightforward. Um, so, reading from the Miller, being is the unseparatedness, sorry, becoming, that's good, right? Becoming is the unseparatedness of being and nothing, not the unity which abstracts from being and nothing. But as the unity of being and nothing, it is this determinate unity in which there is both being and nothing. Although, in fact, technically, it's not a determinate unity yet, because we haven't got to determine being. It's more determinate than being and nothing were. But insofar as being and nothing, each unseparated from its other is, each is not. They are therefore in this unity, but only as vanishing sublated moments. They sink from their initial imagined self-subsistence to the status of moments, which are still distinct, but at the same time are sublated. So they get the idea that being and nothing are on the one hand, the process of vanishing, and a moment of that uh, process. And I'll come back to that because that idea of <coughs> sinking, as he puts it, from self-subsistent to the status of moments is really what he means by of him to, to sublate. Grasped as thus distinguished, each moment is in this distinguishedness as a unity with the other. Becoming, therefore, contains being and nothing as two such unities each of which is itself a unity of being and nothing. The one is being as immediate and as relation to nothing, and the other is nothing as immediate and relation to be, as relation to being. The determinations are of unequal values in these unities. Becoming is, in this way, in a double determination. In one of them, nothing is immediate. That is, the determination starts from nothing which relates itself to being. Or, in other words, changes into it. In the other, being is immediate. That is, the determination starts from being, which changes into nothing. The former is coming to be, that's going from nothing to being, and the latter is ceasing to be, going from being to nothing. Both are the same, becoming, and although they differ so in direction, they interpenetrate and paralyze each other. The one is ceasing to be, being passed over into nothing, but nothing is equally, op equally the opposite of itself, transition into being, coming to be. That's just repeating what I've already said. This coming to be is the other direction. Again, repetition. Nothing passes over into being, but being equally sublates itself and is rather the transition into nothing, is ceasing to be. They are not reciprocally, not reciprocally sublated. The one does not sublate the other externally, but each sublates itself in itself and is in its own self, the opposite of itself. And that is absolutely central. And that really is Hegel's challenge, I suppose, uh, looking back to the whole philosophical tradition that starts with Parmenides. And it's very important to know that the two moments of being and nothing are not sublated or undermined by one another. When we think being, nothing's not on the scene, unlike Parmenides. For Parmenides, being and nothing are already 
contrasted with one another from the very start. Because being is what can be thought and said, and nothing can't be thought and said. And being is clearly not nothing. That's not how Hegel begins. Being is just, it's so indeterminate, it's not even thought in opposition to nothing. As such, though, Hegel thinks, through its own indeterminacy, it sublates itself, it undermines itself. It deprives itself of its own purity by vanishing into nothing. Nothing else does that to it. Now, even if you come to the conclusion that that's not right and something else does do it to it, what you've got to understand is that's not how Hegel sees the matter. So I would say if you judge, oh, Hegel, that's not actually true. It's, it's all governed already. Well, fine, stick that in a box somewhere. But what you're trying to understand is what Hegel thinks is going on. Um, and he clearly thinks that being sublates itself and is itself its own transition into its own opposite. Now that idea that categories turn into their own opposites through themselves is of course profoundly <coughs> opposed to everything that Plato, for example, believes. As you know, for Plato, a thing, an object, can be beautiful and then become ugly. Obviously. A state, look at the Republic, can be good and just and then degenerate through the various stages that he describes into being a tyranny. Obviously, Plato knows that. But it does so by changing its form, through one form replacing another. Plato does not claim that that which makes you good itself, in that respect, makes you ugly. <coughs> or what makes you beautiful, in that respect, makes you ugly. But that's exactly what Hegel's saying here. Pure being, in being pure being, and nothing else, vanishes into nothing. And that's the dialectical moment. That really is what dialectic is, Hegel. Um, there is, I think I've, I've drawn your attention to this, but if not... Uh, I'll do it again. In the encyclopedia, paragraphs 80, 81, and 82 give brief accounts of understanding dialectic and, specul and speculation. And dialectic, paragraph 81, is described as, the, as follows. The dialectical moment is the self-sublation of these finite determinations on their own part and their passing into opposites. Dialectic is not a relationship between something and something else. You cannot, on Hegelian terms, have a dialectic between individual and society. That is gobbledygook. Unless, and because we don't cover this, there is a way in which the individual through itself, in its individuality, socializes itself, and the society in and of itself individuates itself. Fine. But then that's not a dialectic between, that's internal to the different moments. So this is really a very important idea in its own right, but also it's the point at which you begin to encounter what dialectic is. Um, and then that's something to watch for later. Does Hegel stick to this? Are the subsequent movements imminent and uh, self sublating in the way that Hegel uh, thinks they are? Um, right, now I was going to, I think at this point it will be useful just to jump forward a little bit, um, jump to the other side of the um, uh, sublation of becoming into determined being. We'll come back to that, because I just want to talk about this remark on sublation. I won't read it, because it is a remark, and it's very easy to read. But to sublate is to deprive oneself, or to self-sublate, which is a rather unfortunate translation, sich uh, of him. Uh, in paragraph 81, <coughs> is to deprive oneself of one's own independence, to turn oneself into a moment of something else. Um, and so he says, that, obviously he says this without making reference directly to sublation in the paragraph I just read from becoming, but then if you look forward to the remark, um, he's talking about the expression to sublate, um, and then if you look at the, uh, uh, the second full paragraph, um, to sublate has a twofold meaning in the language. On the one hand, it means to preserve, to maintain, and equally it also means uh, to cause to uh, uh, to cause to cease, to put an end to. Also means actually to um, 
to lift off the ground. So that's three minutes. Even to preserve includes a negative element, namely that something is removed from its immediacy and so from an existence which is open to external influences in order to preserve it. Thus what is sublated is at the same time preserved. It has only lost its immediacy, but is not on that account annihilated. So being sublated or self-sublating is the process through which something loses or deprives itself of its own immediacy and independence. It's not the process of being taken up into some unity which is already there, into which it gets subsumed, or under which it gets subsumed. If anything, as we'll see when we get, when we look at the move from becoming to determinate being, the process of sublation constitutes the unity of which the moments are then moments. The unity arises in the very process of sublation. Now there can be, obviously, structures which are there and which then negate and, and, and deprive of independence other features. Yeah, of course they can. But that is not what's built into the very idea of sublation as Hegel's conceiving it here. And this, I think, is what is missed by so many of the later critics of Hegel particularly those who think that Hegel's thought is all about um, you know, the, uh, um, the sort of triumph of subjectivity, um, the idea of a return to self, as if being always already knows that it's going to be Geist. No, it doesn't. That's Heidegger's Hegel, or Derrida's Hegel, or Schelling's Hegel. But it's not Hegel's Hegel. Um, and we see it already here. These moments are not reciprocally sublated, nor are they sublated by any telos that we're supposed to be reaching. They each sublates itself, purely on its own. Does that violate the law of non-contradiction? Well, I guess it probably does. But so what? Who ever said that we should obey that law until it's proven itself to be valid? So anyway, this is again is just trying to highlight uh, what is um, going on. Having said all of this, uh, let me just uh, emphasize again that um, given that sublation dialectic is this movement of self-sublation, it's imminent to whatever we're looking at, um, what follows from that is that there's, no, there's not going to be a single method of development that you're going to find at every point in the world. The way categories develop is peculiar to each category and will change. And as we're about to see when we look at the sublation of becoming into Dasein, that is a, has a different structure from the one we've just uh, looked at. So please bear that uh, in mind. Um, all right, I think though, before we do that, um, I'm going to suggest we look at the shelling. Um, is this sensible? Yes, I think I would, because it sort of relates to what we've uh, just said. Now, I, I have brought a few copies along. Obviously, those I emailed yesterday. I'm hoping you've got your own access to uh, the Shelley piece. There are a few, so if, you, if some of you are here with, that don't have access to the Moodle page, or didn't get the email yesterday, or need the Shelley, then there are, there are a few. There are, there are only about six that you have to share. Sorry about that, but uh, maybe. Is there enough there? Does anybody need the shining or all got the shining? Okay, you've got the shining. Anybody need the shining? Yeah, yeah. And of course you should have your own copy of this book anyway. Shelley's lectures on the history of philosophy are absolutely central to this period. What's the same question? So how should they? Send it For the paper? Uh, it seems like a friend of 45 years. Gosh, it's a C, it's a C, P paper. Gosh. Okay, well, I do apologize. <laughs> well, well, complain. Write letters to Hillary Gasker at CUP and say, oi, what's going on? Um, anyway, it should, it's, a paper, it's a CUP uh, payback, so it should be called that last week. All right, now, for this, um, <laughs> the sequence of categories we've looked at, you <coughs> know, is being, nothing, Becoming. Now we don't. We haven't yet got to determinate being, but we're about to. So let's add it in. And just for shorthand, I'm going to call it Dasein because it's uh, involved less writing. Um, okay. Dasein. So 
being, nothing, becoming, and Dasein. And this is where determinacy enters in. So, being, obviously, is pure immediacy. This is pure immediacy in the form of the negative of nothing. Becoming is this movement of vanishing, and uh, Dasein is the moment of determinacy. And look at that structure. And also bear in mind the, the imminence that I've been trying to emphasize and that Hegel emphasized himself. Now, this is Schelling's, uh, from Schelling's um, Würzburg lectures, I think, which were given in the 1830s or so. Um, he then went on um, to a lectureship in, uh, in Berlin. Um, and it's Schelling looking back at Hegel's logic and giving his account of what he thinks is going on in the logic. So this is not Schelling's view of the matter at hand. It's Schelling's account of what he thinks is going on in the logic. So I'm going to read through it, and then I'll comment on it, and, and I hope you'll be able to see um, where I think the differences are between Schelling's Hegel and Hegel's Hegel. Um, but bear in mind that in the 1840s, Kierkegaard, Engels, and others went to Schelling's lectures, and were hugely, this is hugely influential. Uh, okay, so... Um, All right. Um, so on the left side of the page, I would say about 10 lines up or so, there is a sentence that begins, pure being is as it is being in general. Pure being is, as it is being in general, admittedly non-being in an immediate way, without any immediate, uh, without any mediation. And in this sense, is nothing. This is in Hegel's book. One should not be surprised by this proposition, but rather by that to which it is supposed to serve as a means or transition. From this connection of being and nothing, becoming is supposed to follow. But I first want to note that Hegel wishes to explain that equation of pure being and nothing by the example of the concept of beginning. The thing, as he puts it, is not yet in its beginning. That's from the encyclopedia. Uh, paragraph 88 or somewhere like that. The little word yet, noch, is interpolated here. If one uses this, then the proposition pure being is nothing would only mean being is here from the present point of view still nothing, noch nichts. But in the same way as in the beginning, the non-being of the thing of which it is the beginning, is only the not yet real being of the thing. Though not its complete non-being, but certainly also its being, admittedly not its being in an indeterminate manner, as Hegel puts it, but its possible, its potential being. Then the proposition, pure being is still nothing, would just mean it's not yet real being. But precisely thereby it would itself become determinate, and no longer being in general, but rather determinate being, namely being in potentia. However, with that interpolated yet, something to come, which is yet to be, is already promised, and with the help of this yet, Hegel gets to becoming. Of which he says in a very indeterminate manner that it is the unity or unification of nothing and being, one ought rather to say that it is the transition from nothing, from not yet being to real being. So that in becoming, nothing and being are not united, but instead, nothing's left behind. However, Hegel loves this in the exact way of expressing himself. Remember, they were friends. Uh, but that way, the most trivial things can be given the appearance of something extraordinary. Okay, so let's go over this again and see exactly what he's saying. So, he accepts that pure being um, is understood as non-being, although, of course, that's not exactly what Hegel says. Hegel says pure being is nothing. Uh, non-being as such doesn't, hasn't entered into Hegel's story yet, but we'll, we'll forgive Schelling for that oversight. Um, remember that uh, in the beginning of the first remark after becoming, Hegel says, well, you could talk about Nichtsein, you wouldn't lose anything, but in fact, what we're concerned with here is nothing as relationless. We're concerned with pure nothing, not really with non-being. But what Schelling is surprised by is what this is supposed to lead to. And this is where Schelling gets into his own uh, reading. And he quotes a, a line from uh, Hegel's encyclopedia where Hegel says the thing is not yet in its beginning. And Hegel does say that. 
What Schelling omits to tell you, though, is that Hegel says that about the very idea of beginning. This was the point we looked at last time or the week before. If you ask yourself what beginning means, then beginning must be the beginning of such and such. And so clearly, the beginning is that in which the thing is not yet what it will become, because the beginning is already the promise of what's to become. That's Hegel's point. But then, of course, it's also saying we can't begin the logic with the concept of beginning. Anyway, so Schelling is sort of basing his account of what Hegel's doing in the logic on remarks that Hegel makes about the very concept of beginning. So, given that, though, given that Schelling thinks that Hegel is saying this about being, Schelling's reading goes as follows. Pure being is nothing, but that means, if we stick in the yet or the not, that it's still nothing. It's yet nothing. It's yet to become anything. So the non-being of the thing, of which it is the beginning, <coughs> is the not yet real being of the thing. The pure being, we're not dealing with things, but anyway, pure being is not yet real being, Schelling is saying. That's what Hegel is really saying, despite the inexact language that he uses. So that means that pure being is indeed not yet real being, but it's not purely indeterminate. Because that not yet real being, being not yet real being, is being the potential for real being. And that confers a con determinacy onto pure being. So Schelling writes, uh, in the same way as in the beginning, the non-being of the thing of which it is the beginning is only the not yet real being of the thing. But certainly also its being, admittedly not its being in an indeterminate manner, but its possible being. Pure being, then, is still not nothing. It's still nothing, sorry. That would just mean it's not yet real being. To say that pure being is nothing is to say that it's still nothing is to say that it's not yet real being. But that's to say that pure being is determinate with respect to real being, namely it's not it. That is what determinacy is all about. So if that's right, Schelling's sequence of thoughts is being, nothing, or maybe we could call that uh, not being, or maybe we should call that not yet real being. potential for real being, and that renders being determined. So you can see there's already something slightly peculiar about Schelling's reading of Hegel, because Schelling gets straight to the idea that being is determinate before we've even got to the idea of becoming. But that's not, you can see that, you don't know yet what Hegel means by determinate being. So we've managed to get the becoming without determinate being, Schelling puts it the other way around. <coughs> and what does all the work is this idea of the not being. The, the not -being. <coughs> But then Schelling thinks, well, there is a way of explaining what, um, uh, how becoming arises, and that is in this very idea of potential. So he goes on and says, with that interpolated yet, something to come which is yet to be is already promised. So being is the promise of what is to come, and in that sense, we can say that being is the becoming of what is to come. So being then is becoming. So the sequence of thoughts that Schelling sees in Hegel is being nothing as not yet real being, determinate being, and becoming. But that's the sequence that Hegel, in fact, sets out. So I think Schelling's reading is just completely wrong. I think there is no two ways about it. But having said that, it is enormously important. Because what Schelling introduces is the idea that Hegel's whole logic <coughs> moves forward through an anticipation of where it is supposed to get to. And if you read it like that, then in fact, you know, Schelling's, if, if Hegel were, as it were, honest about that, then in fact Hegel would be what Schelling would later call a negative philosopher, which is absolutely fine. 
absolutely fine, as long as you move on then to what Schelling calls positive philosophy and actually think about real being. <coughs> so Schelling is not necessarily objecting to that story. He's objecting to what he sees as Hegel's dishonesty in some ways, that, that he's not admitting to that. Now, this idea, of course, that being moves forward by anticipating where it's supposed to be going and not yet being it, um, it's incompatible with the idea of the self sublating of, of nothing. But it finds its way, then, into um, uh, people like Kierkegaard, Heidegger. And the one I just want to say a little bit about is Derrida in Blah. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but now you've got this, you can see it a little bit better. What, what, but Derrida adds an extra qualification to this, which is really interesting, and that is that, 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 that Hegel's, um, whatever it is that Hegel's talking about, almost at any point in the system, is always not yet where it's going to go, but it's always, at the same time, always already what it's going to be. And so, in fact, Hegel's spirit, for Derrida, is spanned between not yet being what it is and always already being what it is. It's never joined up with itself. It's always kind of out of kilter with itself because it's always already what it's not yet. Schelling doesn't say that, but you can see that Derrida is thinking in the spirit of Schelling. Again, I think Derrida is wrong, but the story is more complicated and more interesting. And of course, the always already picks up the Heideggerian idea of the Yishu, um, of the... Um, which is a, a, a favorite term of Heidegger's. Anyway, I think it's important that you know about Schelling, you, you know um, where this goes. And I think that then explains, it seems to me, a lot of the way in which Hegel gets read later on. Um, there are other things feeding into this, particularly in France, you know, worries about totality and, and so on, and all of that. But this, it seems to me, is really uh, important. Um, okay, I think what I'd like to do at this point is sort of pause and have a little discussion about this to see what your thoughts are, not just about Shelley, but actually about being, nothing, becoming, and so on, and perhaps about the Shelley. Um, and then when we've done that, we can move on and look at the transition to Dasein. So as always, I think with respect to everybody, I'm going to give the MA students the first dibs, as it were, so if there's, because you're registered for it, so if there's anything... You want to say, I don't want to put you on the spot. I don't want to do that. But if there's something you want to have a first go, yeah. Do you want to yeah, um, go uh, just uh, how my understanding. So you mentioned that the process in the logic is a temple. Um, the so yes. seeing nothing. Not our thinking of it, of course. Not our thinking of it, but the, but the process, process itself, itself yes, is a purely is logical one. one. Right. Yes. So is he? Does he? See, he is identified. He says to he's identified sees himself identifying something in thought. Is this, and in being itself. And in being itself. Yes. So is this is this sort of being and nothing it's the sort of your if you were identifying something not physical but say mental, you're identifying roughly the same thing when you're identifying it as being and nothing. No, thing. no, no. In fact Hegel specifically says that in the remark, the first remark. That that's not what he's saying. He says, you know, some people think that this means that, you know, it's the same thing to say the house is or the house isn't. No, because this is this doesn't apply to determined things. This so so it says, just erase the very thought of a thing out of your mind. This is pure being as such. Pure being as such is nothing. Although of course in in being inseparable and, and indistinguishable from nothing, Hegel also says it's different from it. So there is an immediate difference that vanishes. But that is an immediate difference between pure being and pure nothing. Once you get on to things like houses or things like things, then this dialectic in precisely that form doesn't apply. Because then you're not dealing with pure being and pure nothing anymore. And you, but the point he's trying to get at, and again, we don't know that because we haven't got to the term being, is that logically, it's only this process through the, of the very vanishing of being and nothing that will make determinate being, or even being something, necessary. So it's because he's describing being um, 
in sort of sheer as such, Egypt as yes, such, yes. that it's uh, that, that essentially nothing emerges out of it. Yes. But not in a temporal sense, in a sense. When you like analyze it and look at it. It's, it's, it's a logical, exactly, that's right. So this is not a description of, you know, the Big Bang or something that happened billions of years ago. This is much closer to the claim that, let's say, Spinoza makes about substance being the imminent cause of its modes. It's that for Spinoza, built into the very structure, conceptually, of substance, is the making necessary of modes. And that doesn't, the modes unfold themselves in time, for Spinoza, but the process through which substance makes modes necessary is not itself a temporal one, it's a logical one. Here, it's a different relation, obviously, but being and nothing are logically connected. Um, and yes, so that means that vanishing, the idea of a indeterminacy of, 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 of <coughs> vanishing into another one, belongs for Hegel to logic, not to time. Although it takes time to think it. Um, and so time also is not thematized here, um, but it will be later on. So time will be this movement of vanishing, but as it belongs to space. So time will just be the vanishing, passing away of space for Hegel. Um, it would just be like a fourth dimension of space. Um, but, but time is not an issue here. So yeah, that's a really helpful question. So I would say again, Get rid of any notion of thing. Um, clearly, he's not saying you know, that the logic, the beginning of logic, effectively means it makes no difference whether that is or not. <laughs> well, of course it does. But this isn't pure being. It's a specific thing with certain characteristics and so on. Um, does that help? Yeah, I think that helps. Um, Good, OK. Um, yes, over here. There's a, a story I've sometimes heard about, about, about the begin, beginning of the logic. I'd like you to tell me if there's anything wrong with it, because I think it's a really nice explanatory story of it. So you, you um, thought takes being, and then these, these people, often Adornians, say, and thought instinctively asks itself, what is it that I am thinking? And in doing this, they acquire, uh, they, they say, they, they, the natural answer, obviously the non-linguistic answer, is, well, precisely nothing. But of course, nothing is already pure being. And so you get this, this cycle of flickering going. Now, do you, do, do you smell any sort of element of determinacy in the what is it? Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a very nice way of putting it. Exactly. That's do it. you think there's something iffy about that? I think there's something very iffy about it. Oh, well, it sort of depends if if there is that connection. I mean, if if what is being is just a kind of an innocent way of of capturing thinking what you know, thinking being, mm -hmm. then then it's harmless. So I mean, then it's kind of obvious that, 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 that um, uh, the demands of self-criticism, freedom, presuppositionalists are, you know, lead you to pure being. Mm -hmm. And the thinking of pure being shows it to be nothing. But of course, it shows it to be nothing by virtue of being being, not by virtue of being thought. Um, so if, if the question is innocent like that, that's fine. But if the question is seeking to determine what it is that, that's going on, and then it's very iffy, actually, because then what it means to be nothing is to be not determinate. And so the story would then be, we think being, we ask what it is, expecting it to have some kind of determinacy, we discover that it doesn't have any, ergo, it's not determinate, therefore it's nothing. Nothing would then not be <coughs> The absence of being, it would be in the absence of determinacy, and that's not what that's not what Hegel means. No, and I write actually about this quite extensively in the opening of Hegel's Logic, and there are Hegelians like Friedrich Schick and others who who read it that way, and Pippin in some ways reads it that way. But then, see, Pippin's reading of this is, and and, and I would say by the way, this is a good point to contrast the reading I'm giving with someone like Pippin, because Pippin, I take this story, um, because I take the logic at the very beginning to be, if I can use this language, the activity of disclosing what it is, to think and what it is to be. So we're learning about being, if I can put it like that, right from the very start. And the first thing that we've learned is that being is becoming. And we're then gonna learn that being must be determinate, there must be something, and blah, 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 blah. And someone like Winfield takes the same view, and there are others that take the same view. 
Pippin doesn't. Pippin thinks that what's going on in the beginning of the logic is that Hegel's showing that a certain way of trying to capture determinacy fails. So if we try and capture determinacy in these radically immediate way, then we'll just end up with nothing. So that's a version of what you're talking about. And then he thinks that, in fact, there are similar problems that arise throughout the whole of the logic of being. That trying to capture determinacy through these various categories yields a whole variety of different problems. So the whole of the logic of being, in one sense, for Pippin, is the story of a kind of failure. That leads us on to essence, which shows us, in fact, we're going to need reflexive concepts to start being able to get some conception of what it is to be a determinate object. But even that doesn't work, so eventually what we're going to need is the notion, the whole system, which is a, a bit in Hegel's version of Kant's system of categories. So, so your question is pertinent, um, but I don't accept that. I mean, obviously, you know, you've got to, you pay your money to take your choice. I mean, I don't, I don't accept that reading, um, um, because precisely it, it comes... What, what you shouldn't do is come to being asking or looking for determinacy, not finding it, and then going, oops, it's going to be nothing. And that is, what, that is why there is a difference between being as radically indeterminate and pure, which is what I think they were talking about, and on the other hand, being understood as indeterminate, not determinate. Now, if you understand being in the latter case, then obviously it's not being determinate. It's going to invite you to, you know, you, 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 you look for determinacy, you see that being is non-determinacy, ergo it's nothing. But then the whole thing is guided by the expectation that we should find determinacy anyway. But why would we think of thinking as oriented towards determinacy? Again, my right with Pippin is he assumes from the very start that thinking and cognition is from the very start oriented towards determinacy. It can't find it where it wants it, where it's in pure being. Ergo, it goes to nothing. But Hegel's saying, no, at the very start, thinking is just the thinking of sheer indeterminate being. And not being that is explicitly indeterminate, just being that lacks any determination whatsoever. And so, why would you have the expectation that that would be determinate? You don't. And it's not by failing to be determinate, by failing to be determinacy, that it proves to be nothing. Now, I'm not trying to baffle you here. This is really, really important. Um, and it's a subtle point. Um, and of course, I may be wrong. You know, I mean, I'm just giving you the view I'm, give, I'm giving. But my problem with that story is, imagine, OK, you've got, you know, you've got being. You've got someone who comes along and says, well, what is it? Expecting it to be determinate. And someone says, just don't ask the question. Just, just leave it alone. Just forget about it. What would happen to being if you never asked the question, what is it? Well, on that story, nothing would happen to being. Being would just be being, would be being, would be being. That's not the story Hegel tells. So that story can't be right. Would it be possible to accept your position where there's no deeper explanation in the transition to being nothing and vice versa, and to also allow for the possibility of a retroactive explanation from the perspective of the concept as to how thought, I don't know, had certain uh, in, had, had certain reflexive instincts on itself that made such an explanation intelligible. Yes, in fact, not only is it allowable, in some sense, Hegel thinks it's necessary. So, I mean, the very end of the logic, he yeah, had the, the there's a long section in the in the chapter on the absolute idea all about method. And but on what you end up with is 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 a sort of it may sound uh, slightly bizarre, but the story goes something like this. You start with pure being, and being sort of develops and proves to be the process that Hegel calls the idea, where the idea is simply the unified process of that whole development. Insofar as the as idea is the process of its own emergence, then that idea as process makes it necessary that it begin with an indeterminate beginning, which is pure being. So being makes idea necessary, idea makes being necessary, and that is the circle of philosophy. So in a sense, yes, you're right. But the whole thing wouldn't get off the ground in the first place unless you began with pure being. 
That's why Hegel's account of method has to come at the end once you've discovered, as it were, what the process is. Whereas, I suppose for many philosophers, you would have method at the beginning. What is transcendental method? Well, here it is. You have Fichte, Übelin, Begriffte, Wissenschaftslehrer, tells you how it's going to proceed, and then he does it. Hegel doesn't do that. Hegel does it, and then articulates the method that has kind of arisen out of that. Um, so yes, and, and the idea of, multiple, of those two different perspectives is, is, is correct, and, and Hegel does embrace that. Um, and so the, the question is, um, and I suppose this gets to the Schelling, Schelling's view would be that sort of anticipating where you're going to go, so anticipating retrospection, is kind of already at work at the beginning. And that's got to be, no, 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 no. The beginning's got to be imminent. You get to the end, and then you have a retrospective story you can tell. But you can't get from the beginning to that end by <coughs> anticipating the end at which you would give a retrospective story. I'm hoping that's not unnecessarily complicated, but um, yeah, I think you, well, Jody, you first, and then, and then Tom will just think. Yeah, on the, on, the Schelling, <coughs> on the Schelling piece. Yes. I, I think we could say, perhaps, correct me if I'm wrong, but that Schelling is, in some sense, more within the fold of Parmenides, because he hasn't taken nothing seriously, insofar as, as soon as he starts to talk about the potential to be, he's ori already orientating a kind of movement, as if there's a kind of movement away from nothing towards being. Is that one way we yes, can... Yes, I mean, I mean, one needs to be fair to Schelling, because obviously... Yes and no. I think the thing about, you know, if you, if you take Schelling's um, <coughs> sort of identity <coughs> philosophy, which is a little bit earlier than this, Schelling is the one who wants to argue that... Um, you know, identity is essentially, you know, essentially bound up with difference. I suppose that being, in that sense, is bound up with non-being, which is not obviously Parmenidean. So you would say no. In, in there, in there, there are there is a whole side to Schelling to which Hegel is many ways indebted. Uh, so I want to be shared, uh, fair to Schelling. On the other hand, there's another side. You're absolutely right, and one sees this actually in 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 Schelling's identity philosophy when he says that identity expresses itself as difference, as the indifference of different moments that it kind of generates. So the term indifference, indifference, which is the, you know, the negation of being different, the not being different, but which is inseparable from difference. You can't have indifference without difference that you negate. So identity for Schelling is indifference. So it's tied to difference in, in not being different, but precisely in not being different. So if, if that not being different is being identical, is being, then there's a Parmenidean moment oddly bound up with a non-Parmenidean moment, which is why Schelling is not easy. And I don't want to sort of, I was just focusing on this bit. Um, so I think with that qualification, to be fair to Schelling, don't think of him as just you know, being, being pure Parmenidean. He's very complicated. Spinoza, it seems to me, is a little bit more, which you've worked on obviously, is a little bit more Parmenidean, because there you have no intrinsic principle of, of self-negation within being. Being is being is being is being. The attributes are what they are, pure affirmation. Um, so there you've got more of the, of the heritage of Parmenides. Yes, yeah. yeah, so it's just a kind of question or maybe a comment about, I suppose, maybe pushing why people might be suspicious of what Hades doing. So, a question about the status of logic as a science. Okay. Yeah. So, obviously, one way in which conscientious scientists, you know, help their audience understand what they're doing is say, okay, so here's my method. If you follow this method, you'll maybe get the same results as me, mm -hmm. maybe won't. Okay. And Hegel's doing something different, obviously, but giving you the method at the end, you say, we have to think all this through before you can understand the method. So, you already have to run the experiment in some way before you get the method. How do you run the experiment? And it's always like, I don't know, there's something coercive about this. I mean, hey, okay, we, well, let me start, because that's yeah. actually the way you presented it isn't yeah. right, and if okay. I, I, okay. I may, have, mis I may yeah. have led you to that misunderstanding. There is a method at the very start, yeah. and the method is to be radically and absolutely imminent. Sure. Okay. 
And that is public. It's an exoteric philosophy, not an esoteric philosophy. Each one of you, in thinking being, according to Hegel, should think that vanishing before your very eyes. Pure being, in fact, if you can hold on to pure, indeterminate being, please tell me how you do it. I'd love to know. If you are able to do it, then the chances are, I would say, you're not thinking pure, indeterminate being. You're thinking <coughs> Parmenides being. That is, being, not nothing. Having said that, as being then develops, we have to discover how being develops. And what emerges is then named at the end method. So that method emerges. But, um, so I just wanted to get that yes, clear. Yes. On the question of coercion, that's an interesting one. Hegel thinks, remember, that, that what he's doing here is thinking philosophically in a way that is demanded by the modern age of self-criticism and absolute freedom. That's really important. Yeah, he's a philosopher of freedom, as is Victor, as is Kant, as is Rousseau, philosopher of freedom. <coughs> what freedom means is taking nothing on authority, not being governed by anything given that just is taken to be there. So Hegel is you know, very hostile to the idea, well, you have to believe it because it's like that. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, as you know from the philosophy of right, Hegel thinks there's a necessity inherent in freedom. Yeah. So in the philosophy of right, you get the necessity inherent in freedom. This is the necessity inherent in free. Well, are we coerced by that? Well, in one sense, yes, we are. We're coerced by the very nature of being. Uh, if you don't want to be, well, don't be. You know, I mean, that would be Hegel's response. Like, if you don't want to be free, if you don't want to be free, then fine. But if you want to be free, then you're committed to rights, action, family, economy, state, history, and etc., etc. So, so I can't deny that there is an element of coercion there. What Hegel wants to say, I think, is that it's an imminent coercion, and it's a coercion that you wouldn't think of as being coercion if you see it as intrinsic to being and, as it were, move freely with it. Yeah. But, you know, if you're kind of always wanting to be, you know, a sort of perennial adolescent, you know, don't tell me what to do kind of thing, then, then this is going to be, yeah, it's going to be coercive in a yeah. the destructive sense. So, does that help? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, also kind of leads to my sort of follow-up question in space, which is, again, I'm still, I'm slightly confused about how the logic is supposed to be anything other than just the phenomenology of our thought. So again, I mean, when we're talking about oh, right. our interest in it, and our thinking is, yeah. and like, it's, it's about yeah. our interest in making free of us, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's what gets us going. Yeah. And and I suppose you, you are right that, that that also sustains it. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are plenty of people that have begun the logic and then given up. People have taken this stuff, no, I should say. <laughs> um, okay. um, no, no, absolutely. So you're absolutely right. And, and, and Hegel never denies that. And this is why it's a little bit disingenuous of Kierkegaard to say that, that Hegel kind of forgets this. He doesn't forget. He knows we're thinkers. You know, this is absurd. However, the question is, what is it that we're thinking? I don't mean it. What determines it? What is it that we're thinking? And I, I think, the way I see it, is that Hegel's not trying to describe our experience as we think, but that a dynamic that's inherent in pure being itself, pure nothing, and every subsequent category. So, and that's very different from the phenomenology. The phenomenology is looking specifically at what experience is generated you know, if you take the object this way. Yeah. Um, and you know how the rest of the story goes. So, so that is phenomenology. There are people who think that the logic is a phenomenology. They don't use that term. But because they think precisely that the logic is exploring you know, what happens, what is the experience of thought that you have when you think in this way. And I guess that's not absolutely wrong, given that thinking being will generate a certain experience. Obviously, a conceptual experience. But what Hegel's focuses on is what is generated by beef, nothing, and so on. Sure. So that I say will be the answer. And again, if you're not convinced that he's doing it, maybe go along with, with well, that's what he thinks he's doing. Sure. And that's, in a sense, what we have to evaluate, I suppose, is in each case. So coming now, we have to look at becoming. Does becoming have, within its very logic, the move to um, Dasein? Although we still have to render that explicit. Yeah. So I think that 
you're absolutely right. If we lose that interest, if we give up at some point, then, then I mean, the logic won't stop being validating things, but, but it won't be disclosed. So, and I think that's a very helpful point to, um, to highlight that um, you know, that's the moment of activity. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping you, some of you were surprised when I highlighted that aspect of passivity that Hegel emphasizes. Because you normally think of, of Hegel as a philosopher of activity. But no, I'm, 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 I'm from a Dolly background, so I think of him as being a philosopher of activity. Okay. <laughs> right, but a lot of people think of him, you know, and he says, you know, Geist is active, it's self determining, you know, you've got that, you know, he's, he's close to Goethe, he's close to Kant, and so to discover that element of passivity is, um, is for some surprising. Yeah. Um, but, but okay. <laughs> Any other questions on all of it? Yes. Yeah. So I was just wondering, your reading of Schelling, it seems to me he's not trying to say what Hegel was saying. He's saying Hegel has to either say this, which is a tautology and therefore no one cares, or he's saying this, which he can't possibly be saying. That's because he, he says, um, uh, <clears throat> where, where is it again? Uh, pure being is nothing. Is either meant merely to tautologically or it has the meaning of a judgment. So he's giving them two options. It's either theology yeah. or it's judgment. Yeah. And he's saying it's a judgment. Well, what does that mean? And then he takes it from there and he says, well, they would have to work through this. So his issue is is that Hegel relies on kind of not being explicit, not being determinate, not actually saying anything, is his point. Pure being is nothing doesn't mean anything to Shelley. And if we try and make it mean something, then it doesn't make sense. Or it's wrong. Yes, I mean, I don't think that. I take what I, but I, but I mean, he, if he would, that, that was right, then he wouldn't quote Hegel. He well, quotes, says that we shouldn't talk about Hegel. He quotes, no, he say he quotes Hegel. Yeah, but then he says we shouldn't even talk about him. Uh, that's not actually what he says. He says Hegel loves this inexact way of expressing himself. The point is, it's an inexact way. Hegel doesn't think properly what Hegel's trying to think. Um, okay, I see what you're Yeah, I mean, so I'm, I don't, I don't think that's. I mean, well, actually, I don't think we disagree. Because I think what, you, what you're saying is right. There are those two alternatives. And you're right that Schelling is basically saying, you know, Hegel must have this until it, 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 it alternative in mind. And what do you know? He says the thing is not yet in its being. Hegel says that. So Hegel's being inexact about the implications of the very thing he's thinking. Um, I take it that that's what, what Schelling is getting at. Now, there is a separate question, which is not addressed here. Namely, you know, how should Schelling himself, in negative philosophy, think about all of this? And that might not match this, or it might. We don't know. But um... okay, it's now five past. I suggest we have a. That was a you know, helpful conversation. We have a short break.